our first speaker of this afternoon is Lucas de Groot, as probably everyone in this room already know him from um, his typefaces or interpolation theory, but also in Brazil, he's very well known for his um, project for Folha de São Paulo. And he'll talk a bit about this, among other things. So please, welcome to the stage, Lucas. <laughs> Good. Yeah, um, this is the Foyer de Sao Paulo. This, uh, this event is so important that it was already in the newspaper on Tuesday. Somebody here wrote about it. And I think that's even me on the bottom of the page. Um, that was the last... Uh, that was the last day that I got from the ATPI because normally I look like this the day before the conference, but... <laughs> The last few days I looked like this and I was on a diet of all kinds of pills because I had some food poisoning. So um, I just woke up this morning after two days of blackness. <laughs> um, good. <clears throat> oh, it's too loud. So uh, I'll try this one. Working? Yeah, it's better. Okay. I won't come close to the computer then. Um, so I have to go back a bit in time. In 1993, I uh, moved to Berlin um, to Metrisign. Um, that used to be the company of Erik Spiekeman before he was kicked out, uh, which was not bad for him because he founded a new great design company. Um, and yeah, I came from Amsterdam, went to Berlin. Uh, great city, by the way. And my first job at Metrisign was to um, work on the, the Meta family. I made a Meta Plus. And ah, better. Then in uh, 1994, we were approached by uh, Foyer de Sao Paulo um, because the competition newspaper uh, Foyer de Estado had done had gotten a redesign by um, Garcia, I think it was. And Foyer de Sao Paulo then thought, oh, now we also need somebody important, somebody well known to get a redesign. Um, so they called up Eric Spiekeman. And Eric Spiekerman said, of course, we will help you. We will do a, a typographic consultation and um, actually also propose to make a new uh, typeface for them. And um, yeah, this was all done by... Um, oh, sorry. My brain is not working so well yet, so please bear with me. I've, I've took a lot out of the lecture, so it's a bit shorter, so I can speak a bit slower. Um, our contact person was Eliana Stefan. Um, it was very brave of her that she went into sea with an unknown uh, German company. And um, as Eric told me, he had, he had no experience in redesigning newspapers and also not in designing a new headline font. So he said to me, Lucas, can you do this? And I said, of course, yeah, why not? Um, the first thing we, we noted about the um, for the Sao Paulo was something very funny, that the, the type on the front page was a point bigger than inside. And that was because in a newsstand, then people could read it from a bigger distance. Um, and inside, yeah, they would buy the newspaper and keep it closed and would also be no problem. So that was a nice, very nice idea. Um, as we were doing the typographic consultancy, uh, we, this was all done in Times New Roman. We, of course, we wanted to get rid of Times New Roman. I mean, it's, it's not a bad font, especially if you print it on lousy paper um, with a fast press and a lot of ink. It actually is very good for newspaper print. But we thought, let's move to something more modern. Um, wanted to have a Minion. Uh, of course, we had a Minion Multiple Master, great font from Robert Schlembach. And, this um, allowed me to tune it already very much um, up to uh, yeah, newspaper use. However, after tuning it as well as I could, I found that uh, it still looked a lot smaller. Also, uh, Eliana Stefan from the newspaper said, oh, it's looking so small, uh, can you do something about it? If you compare the times on the left and the minion on the right, yes, way too small. Uh, this is the same amount of text in the same column, so I had to do something. Um, so this is Times as it is, as it was used back then. And this is the Minion. 
as I, as I had, uh, no, this is the meaning out of the box, sorry. Um, so I started with the multiple master, um, tuned it as far as I could, and then came up with this minion, which is almost directly uh, the multiple master. However, I shortened the descenders a little bit to allow for more vertical alignment to make a better readability in the small columns. So that finally worked out. However, um, this was even more important trying to improve by, um, yeah, this is as it comes out of the box. So uh, it means the, between brackets means that this is the default line distance. So if you reduce the line spacing, you can get use a bigger um, type size. If you reduce the spacing, you can even get a bigger type size. So this was the kind of tuning that I did to get it more or less the same, yeah, we see now indeed Times and Jungle Minion, they almost have the same impact, um, but still Minion looks a lot better. So then I invented this terminology, readability per square centimeter, that I was enhancing this way. Um, I have uh, a lot of slides about this terminology, all the different aspects that um, belong to it, but I won't talk about it today because it's too much in detail, maybe next time. So, um, they send us the whole history of uh, the, the mastheads of the newspaper. It's almost 100 years old now, back then it was about 75 years old. And here were some of the sketches uh, on the right bottom. And this was then how it finally developed. So it's, it's not a complete revolution, it's still more or less the same as the old one, but it's cleaner, straighter. Um, it's a bit more lively because it doesn't have the old caps anymore. It has some small caps in between. Well, and then oh, I looked like this back then, a bit pale, <laughs> probably as I am today. Um, yes, so I was going to design uh, the new headline font, but back then I only had uh, one font published. It was this font, a religious font. Um, <laughs> so, and I had a few other funky things done by then. Um, yeah, so they were pretty brave that they trusted me to do this job. <laughs> um, I also had to visit Sao Paulo and um, I heard later on that they were pretty surprised to get this, uh, to not get Mr. Spiekermann himself, but this boy from Holland. Oh well, it worked out quite nice. So here were my first sketches for the typeface. And I hope you can see the tipex and uh, the cutting and pasting in here because that's the way I worked back then, still do it every now and then. And yeah, simply because it's fast, hey, you use a copying machine and especially the cutting and pasting is very nice, doing it on paper, uh, even making a lighter version by, uh, yeah, you can put a, something on a copying machine, then add a sheet of very thin paper in between, make a copy, then the result will be lighter. So there were all kinds of uh, analog digital te uh, analog techniques to to play with the weight. Good sketches, sketches, sketches. Um, actually, this was the only sketch that I made for the italic, and it only took me one day because as soon as the Roman was more or less finished, uh, I knew quite well where the italic had to go. So this was what came out: uh, four weights only. And the semi-bolt and the bolt are really close together, and that's because they were used in different sizes. So Eliana defined that uh, these weights had to be in this, um, in this difference to each other. Good, that's the full set of 1994. Then two years later, the newspaper finally arrived with the fonts. <laughs> it took this long because they had a very complex newspaper system and all the fonts had to be converted and uh, all the layouts that we had done in, on the Macintosh had to be translated to this uh, huge machine. And that really was a lot of work. Um, the newspaper was extremely thick. It was like three uh, big books, really heavy books, so the newspaper was extremely heavy. Um, and also, some other local newspapers were produced at the same time, and all of these newspapers, uh, a pile that was maybe two or three times as thick as this one, 
was produced and layouted within one hour or one and a half hour, which is incredible if you think about it. Yeah, the, everything was automatic, the, the layout and the line, I don't know what, but they had huge computer room back then. Um, and because this all had to be done so fast on a big machine, um, there were very stringent limits on the kerning. I was only allowed to use, uh, I think, 1,024 kerning pairs for the font. Yeah, I consider kerning to be very important. It's part of the design. And uh, it's a very old uh, trait. This is the oldest kerning pair that I found in Italy. It's at least uh, 100 years old, I think, Arnold Bucklin. Although we can see that some Italian cut it off because he cut in the setups of the T and that would not have been necessary. Ah. So, um, many years ago, kerning, pair, kerning tables are very small. Today, kerning tables are huge. Uh, you know that the old Adobe fonts had exactly 115 kerning pairs in 1987. And that was enough for the English language. Um, but of course not if you have a font with a lot of languages and a lot of accented characters. So if you open up my Calibri from Windows 8, you might see that it has almost half a million kerning pairs because all the accented pairs are kerned automatically uh, because of the class kerning. I did not design all of these half a million pairs, of course, by hand. Uh, so class kerning means that if you have an A and an O, that actually you have 100 kerning pairs because you might have 10 A's and 10 O's. And in an OpenType font, it's no problem at all. Um, but in the old days of PostScript, I used to uh, throw away all the pairs between two accented characters because most of them simply never happen. You will never have a kerning pair between this, the A with this accent and the O with this accent or these two characters, they will simply never occur next to each other. So I threw all the double accented characters away and the fonts became light and faster and I was happy um, until I went to Finland <laughs> in, uh, somewhere in the beginning of the 90s and I found this word with, word with uh, 10 letters and six of them were accented letters and uh, they all had accents and in the, in the elevator I saw 10 persons and then I thought, oh my God, I've just thrown away this kerning pair Ah, not good. So I decided now I'm going to investigate languages and I want to know what languages use uh, what kerning pairs. So I defined a new science, the logics of kerning. Uh, this is what I wanted to know about languages, especially the amount of pairs and the occurrence of pairs. How often do, do they occur? I started uh, collecting languages, buying languages from universities and, and analyzing them all. Uh, so I have a huge collection now of, um, yeah, the most used pairs per language. You see this is typically Hungarian, the S and the Z and the G and the Y. Mm, the most used Dutch pairs. Uh, you see this is the top of the list and we see the double O and uh, the double A and the double E. This only happens in Dutch, so even without knowing this is Dutch, you would immediately, I would immediately recognize this can only be Dutch or Afrikaans, which is more or less the same. Um, this is a list of pairs between the space so, and, and the letter. So these are the beginnings of words and these are the endings of words. So I did this with all, uh, well, all European languages. Also several Russian languages right now. Uh, Hebrew as well, yeah. Um, so the most used German pairs, we see that here more words start with a capital S than with a lowercase s. So by this we already know this can only be German because all the nouns start with a capital letter. Uh, also looked at Portuguese. Here are the pairs between two accented letters in Portuguese. And of course, the ones that occur only once, they're probably contamination because the, the bigger amount of text you have, the more contamination you have, spelling mistakes or uh, words from different languages. So these were not serious. So what I did then was I took um, the most used pairs in uh, Portuguese, or actually all used pairs in Portuguese, I put them all in a long list, I put them in context, and then I did kerning only for these Portuguese pairs. And in the end, I had about 700 kerning pairs. So the font became very fast and was ideally kerned for Portuguese. 
Um, another fu funny thing about um, this research was that I was looking at the, the most used counter shapes between um, two letters. And if you uh, regard these counter shapes as, as individual shapes, you will realize that even though we only have 26 letters, 26 shapes, we have much more of these counter shapes. So we see they're all funny different shapes. These are very important for the look of text. They're also important for readability. Actually, some uh, readability problems can be improved by learning about the shapes of these counterforms. Um, and we see that each language has a total different set of uh, most used counter shapes. We see the Hungarian is much more lively, the Turkish is a bit more simple, the counter shapes. So here they are, the 10 most used pairs in these six languages. Sorry, this is supposed to move here. <laughs> you see what a mess I left on my uh, computer this morning. Ah, yes. So these in-between shapes are kind of like a fingerprint of the language. Then some years later, in 1997, I started my own company, Fontfabrik. And uh, there was another art director at Foyer de Sao Paulo who approached me to uh, make two more fonts for them. They wanted to have a lighter weight and a bolder weight, and they also sheet should be a bit narrower, especially the lights should be quite narrow. And uh, yes, I did, of course. I put them in a small catalog of mine. Um, I had made a deal with MetaDesign that uh, if we were going to release the fonts commercially, that we would split the royalties. And uh, after I have brought out this catalog, the font was actually sold once. and. Uh, this was a lawyer of MetaDesign, <laughs> and uh, because uh, you know, I, I didn't even have time to uh, to say, "Hey, I've sold the font once; you can have half the royalties." Then I got a pissed-off letter of the of the lawyer telling me to stop selling fonts immediately, which was not so bad because um, a bit later, uh, Le Monde approached me and they said, "Oh, we want something like the font you did for Foyer de Sao Paulo, but then different." So. Um, I did. At this moment, I should say, I might want to point out that um, this is a, a more or less a left-wing newspaper and that uh, all the left-wing news newspapers from Berlin are using my fonts. I'm really happy about that. Um, also, the, um, the left uh, political party is using my fonts. Yes. And, but I'm mostly proud of uh, this uh, drugstore in Germany that's using my, uh, my the mix. And um, here we have the toilet paper where the letters are imprinted. <laughs> so imagine all the Germans, uh, the thousands of Germans cleaning their behinds with my <laughs> letters every day. <laughs> so Le Monde, uh, French newspaper, was using stone serif, a great font, but they had compressed it awfully. Uh, Sumner might be here, he's probably crawling his, uh, his, his fingers, because uh, this, this compressed is really ugly. Um, so here were a few first sketches, and so what I did, I then completely redesigned the font for Le Monde. Um, started from scratch, you see details in the different, uh, difference in the details, the, the um, voluptuous curves disappeared here. Here, a curve was added, so, and narrower, yes. The, the French wanted to have it narrower, as narrow as possible. Um, and I had a really big problem with, with that, because I was you know, looking at their uh, stone serif compressed, and I said to the art director there, you can't do that. This is so bad for the readability, and I could actually prove him that 
you have a, a lower readability per square centimeter, the more you compress the fonts. And well, finally he gave in and it became a little bit wider than he initially wanted. And he actually visited me in Berlin and he was, we were really fighting over this. Yeah? And he was saying, no, I need to have 71 uh, words, uh, 71 letters per headline for this format. And he said, oh no, please, uh, maybe, maybe 69. And he, he was then writing a few lines with only 69 letters. He said, oh, well, okay, we can do it. And then you could make it a bit wide, really crazy. Um, so, ah, by the way, uh, it was then renamed to Flores uh, because uh, for Le Monde it was named Lucas, the font. But then I had a son who was uh, still a baby and he couldn't complain. Uh, today he is uh, 16 and uh, he still doesn't complain, so I'm happy about that. Yeah, this is the Le Monde font. Still the Le Monde font. But because I was not um, happy with the way it was condensed and uh, I decided, no, I have to be more flexible. I want to make it broader. I want to have more possibilities with that family because I like it. Yeah, this is what Le Monde looked like. By the way, later on they changed to another font of mine. They changed all the time Le Monde. I don't know why. It doesn't help. So, we already might know uh, some flexibility in some tools. This is the great uh, Incubator Pro from, from uh, Sampo Kazila, the guy who invented uh, TrueType at Apple. Uh, you can take any font and stretch it in all directions. And you can even uh, make the descenders longer. You can change the contrast. You don't have to set any guidelines. It works out of the box. I actually have it running here on my computer. But it won't because it crashes every now and then. So um, You might know this great tool, Eras Font Chameleon, which also does a lot of funny things with um, anything as and descender. However, this only works. Uh, this is a strange word? No. OK. Uh, this only works with the existing uh, fonts that are in this uh, program, so not good enough for me either. Um, yeah. So I made a four axis multiple master out of it. That were the, the weight, the width. Um, this is the x height. And uh, descender as well. For those of you who were on the technical session on Tuesday, you saw Yuri had some nice things in his uh, font lab, new font lab, to play with the descenders. However, I'll show another movie to show him that it's not good, but it's not good enough for me at least, because when you make the descenders longer, um, can I play it again? You'll see the comma, it, the angle changes, the comma uh, is as long as the G here, but it grows less. Um, also, the, yeah, also if we move the make the descender a bit longer, also move the so lots of things change. All things that I want to control, just moving a few points down is not good enough. So Yuri, please, more masters. Um, yeah, so I'm now onto the multiple master stuff. So I'll have to talk a bit about my interpolation theory. If you make a range of weights that's going from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven millimeters you will see that it doesn't look good because the visual difference here is 100% and the visual difference here is only 25%. So the fat ones, they seem to be almost the same. And this is what you would love to have, that the proportions between two consecutive weights are the same all the time. Uh, or to say it in Greek, beta is the square root of alpha multiplied by gamma. Um, Oh, sorry. So that's uh, my interpolation theory from uh, 1987. I must have been around five back then. Um, however, I found out after a while that it was not enough. Uh, first, I calculated how is it going to be when I have uh, lots of weights in between. Uh, okay, yeah, so I have this abstract formula. And then I designed this uh, conceptual font, ultra fat font, and look at the X, Y, Z here. <laughs> Speaking into the water bottle. <laughs> so 
So what happens if you interpolate between a very fat and a very light font? So here we have a low contrast, one to one. Here, of course, I have to have a high contrast because this one cannot get any thicker, can't grow anymore. If you interpolate, you get a medium contrast here, but I don't want to have a medium contrast here. I still want to have a low contrast as long as possible. So only when the white and the black are more or less the same, after this point, the the horizontal black should grow slower, and after this point, the horizontal black can't grow any further. Um, so it depends on how many horizontals you have. The, if I have one horizontal, it can grow almost to the top. And four horizontals, of course, they can't grow any further than a quarter of the total height. So here are the, now the interpolation curves for one is for the vertical. And these are for the horizontals, depending if you have one, two, three, or four um, horizontals. This also explains why the euro is such a difficult character, because uh, these four horizontals are always uh, make the letter too dark or are too light. So if you don't want to remember this, uh, go to my website, I have the information there. But you might want to remember that the, if you have two weights and you interpolate, that 50% always looks a little bit too dark and the optical middle is less than 50%. This is a model of how a letter could grow from very light to ultra black. You also see the mid bar of the F uh, lowering a bit. Lots of interesting things going on here. This is called the uh, anisotropic topology dependent uh, interpolation theory. So if we make multiple masters, this old technology, great technology from Adobe. Yeah, first, you might start off with one axis, for instance, weight or width, going from uh, light to black. You might want to add another axis, for instance, for contrast, um, another axis for ascender, another one for descender. And each time you add an axis, you duplicate the amount of uh, masters. You might want to add an axis for weight, and you'll find out that if you have a lot of weights, you need to make uh, a master in the middle because of the because of the, yeah, the interpolation problem that I was showing before. You can control it by adding one or even two uh, weight masters in the middle. Then you might want to add an axis for x height, and maybe even one for serif. So this is how far I got right now. Of course, I would love to uh, to add the access for serif as, as well, but it's a lot of work, and there's no software for it. Um, yeah, I'll have to explain a bit more about uh, the amount of weights. These are the, the original weights of the sense according to the interpolation formula. Um, I then added lighter weights also according to this formula, and the lighter you go, the more difficult it becomes. So Hairline fonts are really very thin, uh, are really very difficult. Um, here they are. And then I decided to make an even thinner font, the thinnest font in the world, because it was going to be only one font unit. And there are no half units, so this was uh, quite a challenge. It, it took me about nine months to complete. Because I thought it's not possible because, especially diagonals, yeah, how can you fit them on the grid so that, oops, sorry, I've lost the letters. <laughs> uh, ah, no, wrong picture, good. I'll show them all. And also connections like here. And so the vertical is one font unit, this is one font unit. And it seems as if these two points are uh, different from each other by just uh, less than a font unit, which is of course not possible. It's not true, because this is one continuous line and there's a point here and a point here. And this spot is by coincidence black, but also because I used another um, control factor to make the overlap as small as possible. So I had to find out a lot of tricks. And it was a great fight with the grid. Um, Sorry, I have to get out of this again. Dear Adobe, 
any time you use uh, you zoom in or out, then the shortcuts don't work anymore in Acrobat. <coughs> Maybe you can fix it. So <coughs> um, after a time, yeah, the font was finished. Uh, I have version 1.4 right now. It has Eastern European support, um, extended Latin even a bit. It's the most useless font in the world because um, at 1,000 point font size, the lines are just one point. And uh, they don't display well on screen because uh, below, four, below four units, the, the rasterizer, at least the ATM rasterizer, used to shut off. So totally unusable. So why are these fonts so difficult? Here's a small example. Mm, this is the letter E, and in the background there's an L. And you see that I had to add extra point here and extra point here to make the width good again, because I could not put this point a bit more to the right, because there's simply no grid, no point on the grid. Uh, this is the O slash. We see an O and a slash in the background, and you see these are all just one font unit apart. And I had to add uh, extra curve points. Um, so you can imagine what a complicated fight it was. You need some good music. During that. Right after that, I decided to make the fattest font in the world. Um, <laughs> however, I soon found out that this was totally the wrong concept. So about um, gaining weight, uh, we first have to switch over to our uh, haute cuisine. Um, in Berlin, we only eat food with our type on it. <laughs> this is our kitchen, all with uh, the sense italic. Um, this is uh, the cake. Uh, something went wrong with, uh, with the cream. And that is because I had um, hidden this uh, beautiful packaging with the sense italic in the, in the vitrine. And Zanestijf is something to keep the, the cream stiff. So. And our intern couldn't find it, so this is what happened to the cream. So I gave it a new, new try to make the fattest font in the world, and decided I want to go all the way up to 2,000 font units for a vertical stroke. Um, and I did have quite a bit of difficulties in finding names for uh, the weights in between. a lot of weight. So here we see now the interpolation curve and the fattest is all the way on top here. So this was the old black. Uh, this was my first try at uh, the fattest. And now this is really <laughs> the fattest. <laughs> the counter shapes and the in-between forms are just... Are, I'm sorry, <laughs> speaking to the water. <laughs> uh, the counter shapes and the in-between forms are just one font unit, so they can't get any smaller. And if you zoom in a lot and you travel around the letters, you can actually read it. <laughs> it takes a while, but once you're curious enough, you'll find out what it says. Here they are together, the thinnest and the fattest. Yeah, totally unusable. However, the interpolations, they get quite interesting. Um, yeah, really funky. This you can, yes, these interpolate, of course. So now you can read it, right? <laughs> Good. Uh, by the way, these interpolation curves, they, um, on the one side we have the theory, on the other side we have the eye. And these are the interpolation curves of the Maitas family. Uh, we have uh, the theoretic curves and the real curves mapped on two of each other simply because once we did the regular width and then wanted to fit the condensed and the white uh, with it, we found that I had to change the, the curve a bit. So these curves, yeah, they might be interesting, but they're not the whole truth. You always have to use your eyes to decide how to uh, position your weights. Ah. Uh, in the year 2000, another weekly newspaper um, approached me. They uh, needed new type. Uh, 
I gave them a few fonts that I had uh, done for Sun Microsystems. They were still exclusive to Sun Microsystems, but yeah, who cared? They never found out. <laughs> and they went broke anyway, or they sold themselves. Um, uh, but for the, for the text in the newspaper, I did something funny. Um, because um, I said to them, here you have two typefaces. And at the top is the uh, minion, and here's the monotype news plant in. Oh, wait, all the other way around. OK, oh, whatever. Um, and you know, both fonts are totally different. Both fonts are not well suited for uh, newspaper, so I had to, to sculpt them a bit. The minion, I started with the folia minion because it was already quite good. And the monotype news plant in, I had to change a lot. I reduced the size of the capitals. They were way too heavy. Um, I changed even the widths of certain letters. And I sculpted the fonts until they both were good enough and until, until they both worked for the newspaper. And then I told the newspaper, please exchange font each paragraph. So minion, news plant in, minion, monotype news plant in, minion, monotype news plant in. They were looking, what? And uh, I said, yeah, it's good because it will keep the reader awake and it's, it's some, <laughs> some subversive element inside your typography. And they did it for nine years. <laughs> and in these nine years, no reader ever noticed that there was something wrong. <laughs> Nobody ever noticed that there were two fonts. Right, yeah, we can see it. Yeah, we, we see, uh, the, for instance, the guillemets here and the guillemets there, they're different. And, oops, sorry, I was speaking to her. Ah, back again. I shouldn't walk away too long. Um, here we see the italic of the minion, which is quite straight and sharp. And a few paragraphs further on, we had the minion of the, the, the italic of the monotype news plant in, which is much rounder and softer. You see, it's also too small because I didn't have time to adjust it. I only had uh, two nights to do this job. Um, and if you look at it digitally, of course, you see the difference. Yeah, minion, totally different atmosphere, much more modern, and the monotype news plant in. It's a bit more old fashioned. And if you zoom in even further, you see total differences. They're all completely different fonts, different details sharp point, round point, uh, such an ending, such an ending. So these are the details that. We, as type designers, you know, we break our heads over these details every day. But now I've proven it doesn't matter at all. Who cares? <laughs> Nobody notices it. <laughs> so. But this is important. Um, this is enhancing the readability per square centimeter that I was talking about before. Uh, this is... Uh, 8.6 on 10.2, and this is 9 on 9.8. The same amount of text in the same column size, but a much higher readability per square centimeter. It's not enough to just take a good font. <coughs> um, this Jungle World newspaper very funny newspaper. Um, they're also using um, the Flores font, Flores de Sao Paulo, Foy de Sao Paulo font, as it is right now. They're actually already progressing on to the next version of the font that I'll talk a bit about later. So, um, I've been here before in uh, 1994, more than 20 years ago, and I've compared the newspaper of today or actually last week, with the newspaper 20 years ago, and see where the newspaper will be going in the future. Um, so this is 1996. The headings were typographically, the mastheads, uh, how do you call them? The cadernos, right? Today they're much more colorful, different set of types next to each other. Um, the small headlines back then, they were much lighter, Today they are much fatter, and to be honest, they're spaced too tight. You also see here a four-lined headline 
back then, yeah, lighter, wider space, today too dark. Um, the newspaper has gotten narrower in these 20 years, probably easier to produce, less weight. In 1996, I was told that the Brazilian reais, the dollar sign in the reais, had to have two lines. The American dollar had one line, but the Brazilian dollar had two lines. I didn't know, so I had to add this sign to the minion. And uh, of course, to the FOIA font. However, today, <laughs> we see that only one line is left. I hope it does not represent the, the devaluation of the reais. <laughs> if it does, This is actually quite nice. <laughs> At least some of the more expensive restaurants in the city still believe in the <laughs> double dollar. So 1996, um, <laughs> we had uh, Sharon Stone in color. Uh, she had clothing on. Today we see uh, Who's this girl? Selena Gomez, yes. Uh, no clothing, but much more hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1986, the newspaper was really extremely heavy compared to today, very thick. Uh, so if we extrapolate this uh, <laughs> to the future, <laughs> In 2022, the printed edition of Feuer de Sao Paulo will cease to exist. <laughs> Everything will be online. Um, yes, so as I've shown you before, in 1996, the, the type on the front page was a bit bigger than inside. Still a nice ID. Today, the size is the same, it seems, but the spacing is a lot tighter inside. I don't know what that's supposed to do with the reader. Um, and yeah, we see that the type size has gone a lot bigger, much, much bigger. Tighter line spacing. Uh, it looks a bit less elegant. It's probably easier to read, but it's a bit less elegant. Uh, the, the problem of this is, of course, that we have a lot of hyphenations. So maybe this is not a problem in uh, Portuguese language, but at least it doesn't look very nice. Um, so, if we look at the amount of words in the newspaper, it has decreased even more because, you know, bigger sizes, less words. So it means that in 2019, the newspaper will run out of words <laughs> before the end of print. Um, so, in 2020, the newspaper will look like this. It will be 99 years then of newspaper. It will be very expensive. Forte Reais. Um, Otavio is still there. <laughs> so it's going to be a really narrow newspaper. And not a lot of text. <laughs> um, very dark headlines, very tightly spaced. And of course, we're going to see a completely naked woman with a lot of hair. <laughs> Good. So, by the way, the font that you're looking at all the time, this is also Flores. This is the, the further development of the font uh, because uh, I added the fifth axis, which is for uh, contrast. So this is the low contrast version and this is the version called uh, Flores Slab White semi bold Roman High x height Short Descenders. An awful name, so... I named it uh, Flores Lowrider. <laughs> My son made a movie for it. <laughs> and I had one intern already uh, doing the um, Cyrillic extension of it. That was quite fun, but she almost went crazy because she had to do this for, uh, I think, yeah, 32 masters.
that's a lot of work. Oops. But it's fun. Thanks to this guy, our Dutch programmer, we can actually um, use it in, um, what's this, Robofont. All right. Might switch to um, FontLab first, the stuff that I'm normally working in on a PC. So here we have the four axes, the weight, the width, the X height, everything's fine, the D sender. Of course, I would like to have another axis for S sender and for contrast. And in order to do this, I had to make another multiple master with another th uh, 16 masters. However, uh, Niels made us something for Robofont that can actually... Yeah. It's unfortunately, it's way too slow to work smoothly. But it's extendable. He could add another master without any problem. So here I challenge the tool makers amongst you to help me with this font because I need better tools. Oops. Uh, uh, one small detail. Um, if you want to follow Lucas Fonts on Twitter, Lucas Fonts is my company, uh, then you might be surprised. I was at least very surprised that my Lucas Fonts uh, handle was already gone. And um, yeah, that somebody called himself at Lucas Fonts, uh, Font Apple, and I thought, hey, this guy is uh, making fun out of me. <laughs> and I found out just this week that he was actually from Brazil, from Sao Paulo. <laughs> Um, he also has an Instagram account. <laughs> yeah, actually, he looks like a very nice guy. Uh, if you look at the statistics, he's probably in his 20s. He has mostly female followers, and he tweet, tweets only casual stuff. So then I found out that his name is Lucas Fontura da Costa Vieira de Goy. So. Congratulations to, with this guy that he has this Twitter handle. So if you know him, please uh, um, teach him about fonts and tell him that fonts are great stuff and maybe one day he can do my tweets. <laughs> this is my Twitter handle. I, I tweet only once a year so you can uh, follow me um, without any danger of uh, getting too much stuff on your Twitter account. Good. I made it. We have time for one or two questions. Hey, that was great. Um, Luke. Hey, um, uh, have you used the uh, language based uh, kerning information for uh, like web font subsetting or anything like that? Because that's a place where now, like previously, you know, PostScript fonts where there's a limitation, um, but now it seems like the web is a place where that happens a lot. No, not for font subsetting because the pair analysis um, doesn't help you with the letters themselves. Right? They are for the pairs, so and you can't subset pairs. So, um, or and and of course, the amount of letters that you have per language uh, is probably not so interesting because they all appear once at least in a block of text of a language. So if you want to go that way, you probably it's better to analyze the text that you actually are going to uh, represent on the web. So. Oh, David. I I wasn't 
quite sure I remember, but I think it was probably you uh, who uh, approached us many years ago about a newspaper version of Minion. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Robert actually did some experiments, but nothing ever got out the door. It's nice to, to see what you did with it. Thank you, yeah. Well, actually, this was, uh, this was uh, the first one was actually just a multiple master version, just uh, the six point drawings. So, yes, it's a, it's a great font for newspaper use. Yep. Thank you very much, Lucas. You're welcome.